Construction Champions, it's your host, Ron Nussbaum, and we're here for another amazing episode of Construction Champions Podcast, where, as always, we're burning the damn house down. And if you're not a frequent listener, that doesn't mean that you pissed off a homeowner and now you're burning the house down. What that means is that house is your business, it's your personal relationships, your relationships with your significant other, your best friend, your employees, your kid, yourself. We're burning those down so we can rebuild them into the champion that we're meant to be so we can change the mindset around the construction industry because the best people I know live in this industry. They work in this industry, and I want us all to have a fantastic reputation. As always, you can find us every Monday and every Thursday with brand new episodes. And we know you don't tune in for Ron Newsbaum. We've gotten the customer feedback on that. You guys are here for all amazing guests that we bring on. And today is no different. Alex, welcome to the show. Thanks, Ron. Thanks for having me. Awesome. I'm super excited for our conversation today. But before we get started, why don't you tell all the champions out there a little bit about yourself? Yeah, my name is Alex Campbell. I am based out of New York City, originally from out of the U.S. and have been here for the last 25 years. Um, I'm Kubi, and I'm one of two partners that have started this business now running for the last four years. Uh, we design, develop, deploy uh, mobile micro factories. Now that sounds crazy. Those mobile micro factories, they manufacture and assemble homes. And we're here to reduce one single KPI that I think a lot of your audience has seen firsthand. And it's a very aging demographic of skilled construction labor that's missing from the ecosystem. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out a way, and we think we have figured out a way, how can we build more houses with fewer hands? Awesome, man. It's exciting. What you guys are doing is exciting. That's why I'm excited for this interview. It's a great time to be in the construction industry. You guys are doing great things. I'm going to dive right in there. I'm going to ask the million dollar question. And that is what makes a construction champion? Hey, Buildercoms really shines by keeping everyone on the same page. Imagine all your documents, photos, and communications streamlined in one place. No more lost paperwork or miscommunication. Check it out now and see your projects transform effortlessly. Yeah, look, I think construction is one of the most vital sectors to any economy. It doesn't matter which country you go to, the backbone of most society is us building things. And I think we've gotten to a place in the U.S. where Unfortunately, construction has gotten less efficient over time and construction labor has gotten more efficient. And it's, of course, ironic and almost paradoxical, given that all other industries have been more efficient through technology and gotten more efficient. Construction has gotten less efficient. Um, you can argue that part of that is bureaucratic. Part of that is, you know, the way we we we're building has changed. It's gotten more compliant and regulatory enabled, et cetera. But look, to us, we think that Less folks are excited about joining this industry. It's hard, uh, it's very labor intensive, it's physical, it's dangerous uh, to some extent relative to other industries. And we have less labor that's entering this workforce. And I think statistically for every seven folks that retire now in construction, only one replaces them. Mm -hmm. So we're heading in a negative trajectory when it comes to supply demand of construction workforce. And that's generally what we believe is resulting in the expensive housing that's out there today is because we're not building enough because we don't have enough hands to go build. So I think a champion is someone that finds more efficient ways to build, enables existing workforce and existing uh, construction practices, methodologies, and allows for us to build more uh, with less hands, as I said. I love it. A lot to unpack in there. A lot of great points. And I love it when a guest comes on and they give me so many different ways we can dive dive into this. And I think how I'm going to is the efficiency thing. Like, why do you think it, like you, you gave a couple points with regulations and this, but every other industry, they faced all the same things. And somehow they managed to get more efficient as construction or as technology came out. And here we are, the construction industry not doing the same you're starting to see some embracement of technology but the the efficiencies that come with that like we're still lagging behind why why do you think that is yeah i i think one big challenge is 
we're stubborn. I come from the development industry. You know, we, we have a very stubborn industry. It does not like change. It is conservative inherently because there's a lot of fragmentation, a lot of moving pieces, and a lot of parties that are not incentivized for things to go incredibly efficient per se. Mm. Um, that's one. Two, construction in general is one of those industries that can have massive top line, but margins are incredibly tiny. We're talking about average GCs on a good year doing four or five, six percent margin. That is a top performing GC. Most are left with one percent margin at the end of the day. That is not enough capital to reinvest in innovation, in finding more efficient methodologies, et cetera. Um, so I think those are the really two big laggards there. Um, historically, uh, also innovating in this space is hard categorically because it requires venture capital that's not used to backing things that are capital intensive, specifically hardware, specifically uh, things that take longer timelines and can't necessarily grow exponentially. So I think it's a gamut of things. But more importantly, again, like we're in a very conservative industry. You have to respect the industry. You can't transform it, disrupt it. You have to transitionally uh, enable the industry is the better way to put it. So it's things that are incremental versus 180. Um, yeah, no, I, I'm I 100% on point with that. And I think that's where some I had a great conversation, not on the podcast, but with another guy that's in construction software. And we were talking about venture capitalists and what that looks like, like in the construction world, that there is such a disconnect. Because like what you're saying is, you just can't come in here and completely disrupt something and have this super trajectory. Like that is the unicorn within the unicorn within the construction space. But the long lasting, when you look at what you can do with technology with a longer trajectory in the construction space, we've seen companies that go end up going public, but the, the money that backs that kind of stuff isn't, in the ride for that long like they don't want stuff that's going to last that long but they want to be in this market and there's really a, a paradox in how that mindset is going to have to shift for the money to be able to flow into the development of technology within the construction industry yeah cost of capital is an important function here that's really what it comes down to and i think there is a missing cost of capital need in this space I think, look, for R&D, venture is always the right move, right? Private equity and more traditional folks are never backing the untested technology or the R&D required. It's venture that's doing it, but you have to quickly phase out of venture into the correct cost of capital. Um, also, look, we, we go back to like the conservative function. It's a very hard space to penetrate. Um, the only way I think this industry makes decisions, you really have to come out with something that's day one cost accretive. Like, you know, you coming from construction world too, you're not doing something or buying something or deploying something that's great over-engineered, but costs more. Folks forget that. This industry, you know, what's the saying? Money talks. This is very much a quintessential industry where that's true. If you can't be at cost parity or cheaper, you are irrelevant. No developer, no GC cares about your solution if it doesn't save them dollars day one. That's the only way they're taking incremental risk deviating away from their traditional day-to-day -day. Mm. yeah no that's that's completely on point and that goes back to that where you're talking about the low the low margins and one of the things that fascinates me with that is like the stuff that can increase those margins all the investments that have to be made in like that weighing of that is we're not going to make that investment. A lot of times uh, for technology, wise, like I look at it as the construction industry, it's like taking somebody that's been going to work the same way for a decade and they come up to this light and they go left every day. But if you tell them and show them that they can go right and save 10 minutes, you still have a decade of unprogramming and retraining to get them to go right every time. They still want to go left. And that that's one of the hard the hard hurdles that has to be overcome with adapting new technologies and stuff that's going to make them more efficient in their job. I think your audience will best resonate with what we do if I you know create an analogy to Henry Ford, right? Every time building a car back then was a one-off project. 
Henry Ford said, let me focus on the system, not the product, and let's make that system incredibly efficient. That's what we're trying to do. And you know that has been called industrializing construction as a main category item. I think if you subdivide that category, there's really three methods to doing so. There's modular volumetric construction. You build an entire room offsite, you ship it thousands of miles. There's prefab where you deconstruct all the components or some components of what makes up a building and you ship that thousands of miles. And there's 3D printing. Uh, we like to think of ourselves as really almost neither of those. We think that there's really three pillars around getting this right. One, we don't think centralized gigafactories are the move, right? Imagine you could spend a hundred million bucks on a gigafactory like Tesla has done for their cars and you ship buildings or parts to state lines, different countries. We think that's awkward. We think it's impractical. A building or components of a building doing that hundreds of times a year, you're talking about millions of square feet worth of shipping, millions of tons, et cetera. It's impractical. And the feedback loop between this product that you're selling into the value chain versus on-site construction is too far. So we have a thesis around decentralizing, distributing a network of smaller footprint factories that do one of two things. One, they make things from scratch. Inside of here, we get to make components, windows, framing, helical piers for the foundation, et cetera. And two, we take things off the shelf like sheetrock and text pipes, kitchen cabinets, and we prep those things. We get to package those things into pallets and send them in a last mile format down the street to the construction site where it's our unskilled labor that's putting together a home using those kit of parts. Mm -hmm. So we believe in this decentralized approach. Two, we believe in not changing or augmenting too much the end product being the home. The more you over-engineer, the more you deviate away from what Lennar is building, the more you get Rons of the world saying, uh uh, I don't know what this is. I'm not employing it. And two, you get inspectors that show up on site that look at this and say, no way, Jose, I've never seen this in my life. I am not risking someone's life, even if it's perfectly safe and great and engineered and tested to be so. So we don't believe in deviating away from end product. It needs to be assembled on site, not pre platted with like MEP in a panel. We believe it's all uh, done on site in a traditional manner using very recognizable materials and parts because incumbent adoption is hard and regulatory compliance is hard. Mm -hmm. The more you step away from that, the more you run this uphill battle. And the third principle that we employ is relatively simple and it goes back to the one we talked about. You can't be a cost parity or cheaper. No one cares. And we told ourselves we'll never go to market unless we can start building homes at about a hundred bucks a foot from foundation to finishes. And that's what we're trekking towards. That's what we've been doing. That's what we can show receipts for. And we've been successful in doing that within our own case studies. Um, but end of the day, our business is not to be a developer. It's not to compete with you. It's not to compete with a GC necessarily. It's not to compete with a developer. We're really good at this thing. How do we be McDonald's? We're neutral. Like, let's go put up a bunch of these with a bunch of folks like Ron and anyone else that's localized. How do we give them this superpower, this tool, this magic screwdriver to go build homes? That's really what we're about. Yeah, I mean that's what's important right now when we look at when we look at the amount of homes that have to be built. And I love when you're talking about like that's just do it like we've done it, but not do it like we've done it. Because you're right, like we tend to like people try to change too much stuff, and then you have inspectors and builders that are like, hold on a minute, like this is way my guys don't know how to do this. But if we can keep it the same, it's just more efficient we're just trying to change process and delivery mechanism that's all i love that and what does that look like from a, a a local perspective say you're a local builder and you're like i think this is something that intrigues me what what would that look like so we generally get approached by a gamut of folks and the folks that are approaching us are their logic is the following wow i can own one of these in my market this thing is approximately 10 million bucks, which is not a lot of capital necessarily for manufacturing business. It's not relative to the yeah. billion dollar infrastructure project factories that are out there from Micron to Samsung to you're in the Carolinas. There's quite a lot of uh, manufacturing infrastructure headed that way. Um, so 10 million bucks is not a lot. The folks approach us and we figure out a way how to co-capitalize that upfront CapEx to launch one of these. Remember, it's a mobile micro factory. They need a piece of land. 
several weeks later, you have a full functioning facility. It's a containerized solution of a mnemonic uh, structure, inflatable structure on top. Uh, all our machines live inside the container, so they quick deploy into stations that do one of those two things I told you about. Um, but essentially, folks approach us, we co-capitalize. Those folks end up owning a pretty profitable manufacturing business. Each one of these mobile micro factories can produce about 430,000 square feet of output. That's about 200 homes a year. So in some cases, our partners end up wanting to smoke their own supply, meaning they use our commingled factory to essentially build homes for their dev co that they own in all of it, its entirety, or it ends up servicing a bunch of Bob Smith home builders within a 150 mile radius that build 10, 20 homes a year. Mm. There's several of those customers that end up feeding the factory. But the idea is it's a very localized solution. Um, its function is to be is to essentially do the work of a GC and all the subcontractors end to end. There's no third parties anymore. So it's essentially a solution to a home builder from foundation to interior finish, all the vertical. Mm. So, like you said, beating the suppliers, so you no longer start to run into the jam up of stuff showing up at the job site. When's it showing up? Backlogs because you. This control. is this is all part of that process. Yes, um, the, the mobile micro factory itself is fed by about six hundred SKUs, so raw inputs that get turned into something or are the final end product, but get prepped for on-site assembly. Awesome. I love that because that, it just makes you more efficient. It's one of the things that's hard to control is when stuff's showing up. And if you if you operate the manufacturer, like I think your example of that developer that's building 200 homes a year and is always running into the supply issues, like $10 million to get this up and going and now control your own supply that's it's vertical It's vertical integration, but it's also day one cost savings. Like I said, we can build cheaper than existing home builders today. Um, I'm not sure we're yet at a point where we consistently in all markets build cheaper than the top 10 home builders who are incredibly efficient. They build 60,000 homes a year, right? When you talk about some of the public guys, but we for sure can build cheaper than Bob Smith that's building <laughs> for 250 a foot, 10 homes a year, and actually needs the help competing with the primes being those top 10 home builders. Yeah, and I, I think that's a great thing to think about, especially for all listeners out there. If you are building 10, 15, 20 houses and you like a way to be able to start to control those margins. And I, I would have to think that not just that when you start talking $100 a square foot, but the lost opportunity time, the time that's lost of guys sitting around waiting for stuff to show up, that has to drastically decrease as well with this program. So it's $100 a square foot to us, to the factory. That's the COGS. We don't always um, end up quoting or selling that to home builders because it's it's market dependent, right? Because we go into a market and let's say Bob Smith is building for two fifty dollars a foot. This is Boston, Right. We come into the market and we say, great, let's offer a 20% discount to that. That's incentive enough for Bob Smith to start working with Kubi. Um, and then the factory's profit is anywhere between that, you know, dollar to the depth code of Bob Smith versus $100. That's the margin. Um, so it's market dependent. That being said, yes, soft cost, carry cost, all of that is interesting. It's hard for folks to underwrite that in their equation. I think it's easier to first tell them, look, hard costs are day one cheaper. It's a much easier underwriting versus speculating on, look, look, it'll be faster. There'll be less you know, uh, rework because of unforced errors, et cetera. So we think hard cost is a bit easier to communicate as a sales pitch versus speculating I, well, on other yeah, things. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that because I, I live in the word of talking about what those costs are and how you can improve them and coming from an operational background. Like I understand that stuff and I understood what it, what it meant to have a crew sitting at a house doing nothing and having to push another job out. I know people, we don't, it's a hard thing to convey, but it's something people don't necessarily think about. Like how much money is that literally costing you on a daily basis, because it's not just that crew there right now, it's the efficiency of the NETS project and what ends up happening. And anytime you can change those variables for your business, all it does is just increase the profit margin on that project. 
And also the stress levels go way down for everybody involved. Um, it's even a bigger equation for us because as I told you, we have one KPI and it's the reduction in skilled labor. So we're not necessarily using to build homes a typical construction worker. We can take someone off the street, train them for two months and they'll be able to build a home. And that's the beauty of our system. That's the beauty of lean manufacturing by definition. We break up the steps in such a manner that they no longer require a certain level of skill. So let's dive into that a little bit, because, I mean, that's one of the big issues facing the construction industry right now is how, like you said, seven guys are leaving, one's coming in. The the trajectory, I think, like, ever since I've been in the construction industry, there's been a labor problem. But the problem is right now is that there's a huge uptick in what has to be built, and we're having a, a labor problem at the same time. So it's like the trade. Totally. That is, that is the big equation. That, that's, that's what's why, making it worse. Yeah, and that's why there's catalysts around solving this and why folks are looking around for solutions. Um, let me ask you something anecdotally, because you're in job sites all the time. What do you reckon is the average age of the guys you're seeing on site swinging hammers? A lot older than what you'd want them to be right now. Like heading yeah, to so retirement. I, I, I don't have a big enough sample size of like going to what's the right end greater than like 500 is the right sample size to take surveys or whatever. I can't tell you I've been on 500 different construction sites, but I've read statistically there's average ages 42 years old, which means give it another 10 years. Most of those folks are going to be reaching retirement, right? So like that's pretty wild for a physically intensive industry. I wouldn't say it's it's probably an exception to be 42 and fit, right? A mm -hmm. lot of folks entering 42 are probably less physically fit um, than they need to be for such a physically intensive industry. Um, so yeah, it's getting hard. Um, I, the way we solve that is by definition of lean manufacturing, lean manufacturing being think the way Toyota makes a car. Um, we're essentially breaking up the steps from manufacturing to on-site assembly. We're giving folks instructions that are dynamic with every sub-assembly and build, meaning like, here's what you do at this point in time. Look, like you just got to do this, turn this, put this over here, et cetera. There's like a literal breakup of steps in a process-oriented way, which doesn't require someone to go and weld on site, doesn't require someone to uh, cut sheetrock on site, you know, like things that are messy, things that Actually, I'll say it differently. Much of construction today is not a binary good or bad job. Some of it is very objective, right? Yeah. And that's hard to quantify and measure. That's what makes kind of something impossible to say whether like someone's doing a really good job or a really bad job because it's somewhere in the middle and different, et cetera. We're trying to make it so where it's like an objectively like do this and it can only be done this way. If you don't, you are not doing it correctly. You probably... You know, either we're training you wrong or you, you don't have a job with mm. us. Um, and that's up to us to demystify and lower those steps and operations to make sure it's easy enough and our kit of parts come together the way they intend to. It's like a multivariate equation, it's not just one thing that happens that allows us to not use skilled labor for the most part. I love it. So I have to ask, what got you down this road? Like, what was the aha moment that created this yeah I, I come from as i said mostly real estate but not from kind of where i assume most of your viewership comes from i come from um deploying capital into real estate and development projects and um really like the let's call it in the office job of real estate <laughs> um and i always thought I, I you know i spent a lot of time in technology i always thought that i'm a progressive developer or investor, like I've always wanted to use tools that are interesting that could create a moat uh, from a competitive perspective. And there wasn't anything that I could use around the industrialized construction space. Folks have been trying to, you know, attack the space for the last decade aggressively, maybe even two decades. No one's come, come up with a solution. And I firsthand felt how I as a developer, you know, even not that conservative couldn't use any of these solutions. Um, I met my partner about four years ago, Oleg, this is the brainchild of my partner. Um, he had the thesis of essentially bringing the factory closer to site as a means of making lean manufacturing work in the space. And um, when I heard the thesis, I said, look, this makes total sense. This is very first principles. This is probably how it should be done. And we came together to commercialize this. So it was really more of a passion meets the right person that's executing. 
Awesome, man. I love it. I love what you're doing. Uh, for everybody out there listening, if they wanted to connect with you, learn more about what you're doing, have a conversation with you, what, what's the best places for them to do that? Yeah, I think just going straight to our website, kubi, C-U-B-Y, technologies.com. Um, there is a contact us a forum there. I usually get CC'd on those. Um, so just reaching out that way. And we have conversations with everyone. We're in the mode of like knowing what we need to solve for, for the folks that reach out to us. Mm. So always happy to listen and take feedback and find ways to maybe go launch factories together. That's our business. Awesome, man. Well, thank you for taking the time and being on the show today. Thanks, Ron. All right. right I guess that will be the cut. Oh, sorry. <laughs> All right, construction champions. Another episode in the bay where we really talked about efficiencies and what does that look like? Alex is going about it in an amazing way to go out there and start to make companies better, be able to build houses better. And for some reason in the construction industry, this becomes a roadblock for people. We start trying to think and we immediately always go back to how we've always done it. In order for the construction industry to move forward, in order for us to be able to fulfill what is going to be needed out of the industry in the next 10, 20 years, we can't rely on how we've always done it. Like that cannot be the default of where we go back to. Because every time you start to have somewhat of a breakthrough and something happens, it's like that's what we go back to. And we're just like, well, we just, we won't, we don't have to continue on with that. Let's just go back to how we've always done it. That's not how breakthroughs happen. That's not how we move the industry forward. So whatever you're working on, look at it. How can we be more efficient? How can you make sure that stuff's showing up at your job site? Maybe reach out to Alex, have a conversation with him. He's, he's over. He wants to understand this so he can have an impact on the construction industry. So what I love about what they're doing is like that mindset around the construction industry matters so much. It's like the more conversations we have, the more people that get involved and start to become part of the solution in moving the industry forward. Anybody that's listening on video is going to be able to see this is we're going to start to be able to do this where solutions in the industry are going to start to be able to meet each other and come together like a perfect puzzle. The problem is, is we have people building solutions and we have the construction industry and we just can't seem to get them to talk to other. It's one of the reasons I do this podcast is because I want to facilitate these conversations. I want to help this start to happen because that is the only way that Alex can go take his solution and have the impact that it's meant to have is if. People are willing to come in and help give that help guidance, like how this is how we could practically use this here where we're at. Same thing with what I do with builder comms. I'm always customer feedback. Let's talk what is working, what is not working, what makes sense, because that's how we create solutions that actually have a huge impact on the construction industries. When we come together as a solution in the industry and become one, and it's so powerful. And that's where we need to head here, headed into 2025. I'm just saying it again, but construction champions, make sure you go out, you check out all of our fantastic sponsors. And until next time, be the champion you were meant to be. Introducing Buildercoms, your all-in-one construction communication software. Say goodbye to communication mishaps that cause frustration among builders, contractors, and clients. The Buildercoms platform unifies communications, making it easy for you to chat, share updates, and collaborate effectively in one place. Experience the transformation in construction project management with Buildercoms. Visit us at Buildercoms.com to learn more and start streamlining your projects today.